y'all proclaim this one. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. By his blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, his life is destined. Here we go. Oh, praise to God our Father. Oh, praise to Christ the Son. Oh, praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome. The King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name. have seen. I believe that a day is coming. He's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning. See the lamb who rose a roaring lion. All praise. All praise to God our Father. All praise to Christ the Son. I could be seated for just a moment. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Owen. I am one of the pastors here at Progression Church. And I just want to welcome you. Uh, welcome you if, if you're just in town um, for the game or you have been here forever or this is your first time in general. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, we desire at Progression Church for this to be a place where you can find um, your spiritual 
home where um, as saints, um, as believers in Christ, we can come together um, and worship him as he deserves. To begin our worship service, I want to read out of the Psalms. And the reason why we do this is so that we can reflect on who God is and allow that to um, direct our hearts in this proper way. In Psalm 86, starting in verse 1, it says this, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. A couple things I just want to encourage us in and remind us of. One of the things that properly um, places our heart in a place of, of true worship is when we realize that all of us are simply poor and needy humans who need our God. There's nothing in us that, that is um, righteous in and of itself. We need our God. And one thing I love about the psalm is it gives us encouragement to call out to that God. Because in verse 5 it says, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. So this morning, let's all call upon our God in worship, in prayer, and let us trust that he is truly good and forgiving towards us. And we'll lead us in a time of prayer, and then we'll continue in worship. Take a moment to simply thank God for being good and forgiving towards you. Take a moment to thank God for his steadfast love towards you, which, which he has shown in the death and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And ask him by his Holy Spirit to soften your heart, to help you realize that you truly do need him, and help him to worship you today. Lord, we thank you. I pray by your spirit, Lord, that you just help us to worship you as you deserve. May we acknowledge your steadfast love towards us, your goodness towards us, and your forgiveness towards us. And may that draw out of us a genuine desire to call upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. <laughs>
Sing Christ alone, Christ alone. He's love. We believe it and we sing it. Christ. can be seated this morning. Progression Church, y'all make some noise if you're glad you came today. Yeah, I love it. I love the uh, I love the energy. The weather's not very pretty, but the energy's good in here. Okay, um, and so hey, we're really glad you're here. If this is your first time here, my name's Joe. I'm just one of the, the pastors here at the church, one of the teaching pastors, and uh, we're so glad that you made it. Um, as you can see, we're going through a series uh, in the book of Philippians. Um, it's been a really fun series. Philippians is a really fun book to go through. Uh, all kinds of good stuff to draw out of it. And so we're delighted that you're here. We're glad you're here. Um, and it's an honor for me to get to carry this series on. And I'm really excited about what we're going to learn about today. I think it's going to make a big difference in your life. Um, before we do, before we get into it, I just want to do a quick survey. How many of you start to geek out 
around the holiday season. How many of you are like, I'm a holiday season person? This should be most of us, right? How many of you, it starts around Halloween? You're like, Halloween, yes, Halloween. Halloween is kind of like sneakily, kind of sneaking up on Christmas, I feel like, okay? Um, and then also you say, hey, man, give me November, okay? November is my favorite because of, okay, one of you, awesome. Uh, and then, uh, you know, because you're like, give me the pumpkin spice, right? The pumpkin spice comes out. Um, and then at some point, Christmas is just kind of moved in on November's territory, okay? Like you're just starting to see Christmas stuff sooner and sooner. How many of you say, man, I love seeing those Christmas cups at Starbucks, okay? You're like, it, it, I feel something inside when I see that, that Starbucks cup, right? And you're like posting it to your Instagram and everything. Well, yeah, we, we love the handies. We love Christmas time. We love the holidays. It's hard for us. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Our Christmas tree is up in our house right now, okay? So, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> wow, legitimately getting booed. <laughs> okay, I knew some of us would feel strong about that. Um, but, uh, but anyways, yeah, how many of you, anybody else got theirs up just out of curiosity? Ha <laughs> ha, I knew I wasn't by myself. Okay, so, okay guys, um, a part of gathering as the saints is we don't boo each other. Okay, that's not like, I don't think that's what the, uh, the early church intended, but no, nah, I'm just kidding. But, um, but anyways, yeah, so we're super pumped about Christmas, but one of the, one of the things that we would uh, do is usually Jess, she works for a company, um, a, a, just a, a, a medicine group company um, that works with hospitals and stuff, and they usually throw a Christmas party. And so, uh, but one of the things that they've started to, to get away from, and they actually started to do, which has actually been pretty fun, is because uh, the, the company is owned uh, largely and has a lot of doctors that are staff that are Indian Americans, Asian Americans, but they're from India, um, is they have started having a Diwali party, okay? And so th they do a Diwali party, and at first, whenever I heard about it, I was like, I don't know about this, but I'm going to tell y'all, Diwali parties are awesome, okay? Okay, so uh, we, we get to dress in, like, uh, Indian, traditional Indian garb, and, like, I think I've got a picture of it uh, here, so, like, we go and we celebrate, and, like, Jess is, like, decked out in her stuff, and I am wearing a kurta, um, so, uh, you know, it's very, very fancy sounding, but anyways, we go to this party and it's a lot of fun and inevitably people are all, they're going to get on the dance floor. Okay. Cause I'm just telling you, they know how to party at these things. So great. And so, uh, at that portion, uh, I, I would say this, I'm not most comfortable on the dance floor. Is anybody, would anybody share in that sentiment? You're like, I'm not very comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're, you're in good company. All right. I have two left feet. All right, so whenever I play like the dancing games, this is a true story. This, this, this is what happens, true story. Uh, I'm like dancing in the dancing game in front of my family, and Jess is like, Joe, be serious, be for real, like <laughs> seriously, try. And I'm like, I am trying. She's like, I'm serious, Joe, like tr take, try and participate. And I'm like, I am participating. <laughs> like this is literally, I'm trying to leave it on the dance floor. I'm just that bad, okay? I'm not a good dancer. And so anyways... Uh, the dance floor is always full at this, um, and, it, and, and it's almost like it's a tradition. There's one particular doctor there, and he's so much fun. He's a lot of fun, but there's going to be a portion of the, of the dancing where he's going to end up in a big dance circle, and he is getting after it, and he is doing all these like really cool traditional Indian dances. Uh, you wish. I'm not about to do them, okay? <laughs> But uh, you wish. But anyway, he's doing all these really cool dances, and usually it amounts to people just kind of following his lead. They're following along with what he's doing. And y'all, I'm telling you, this is called, for Joe Handy, this is called a lifeline. I need somebody to show me what to do, okay? Because I want to be out on the dance floor because Jess loves to dance, but I also need some help, okay? And so usually he'll get out there, and he'll start cutting a rug, and then I'll start imitating him, and then I'll be like, yes, I'm one of y'all. This is awesome, you know, and like we have fun, and it's a blast. Um, but usually there's going to be some kind of uh, me just kind of looking around and seeing what other people are doing, and then I do it too, you know. Um, and so why do I bring up that story? What does this have to do with anything? Um, the, um, today we're going to talk about, and Paul's going to emphasize the importance of imitation. The importance of imitation, in your walk with God, who you imitate matters. In your walk with God, who you imitate matters. In the same way that 
Uh, I viewed this particular employee, this doctor, as my lifeline, the one that I looked to in the moment that I needed him most, which is dancing as Christians. Who you look to and who you imitate matters. It matters tremendously. And we're going to get into a little bit about why it matters. Paul teaches us why it matters. And so we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to get started at verse 17. Now, I want to set the context up for you just a little bit before we start reading our scriptures. And it's this. You'll remember about a week or so ago, um, Pastor Brian talked about how there was a group known as the Judaizers. The Judaizers would say, yeah, Jesus is great, but you also have to become a Jew and practice a lot of Jewish tradition in order to be saved. Okay, And so they would say, Jesus plus something equals salvation, but the truth is, Jesus plus nothing equals what? Ev- everything and salvation, right? Okay, um, yeah, yeah, they're both right. Those are both right answers, right? Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Jesus plus nothing equals everything for us as Christians. And so there was this group who said, you have to observe these laws because these laws are also what's going to help Jesus kind of get you over the finish line, right? That's kind of how what they believed. Now, what we're going to look at this week is Paul kind of shifts and he starts addressing a different group of people. So they were embedded in Roman and Greek culture, which had a high emphasis on pleasure and enjoyment and, you know, live while you're living and enjoy life right here and right now. Um, also, there was this loose uh, belief system. It wasn't like a formal group of people, but there was this type of belief system. It's kind of a fancy word. It's known as antinomianism. Tell your neighbor, antinomianism. Okay, antinomianism. Antinomianism is kind of this idea, okay? It's, it's similar to what the Judaizers were doing, is they were saying, yes, grace is good, and Jesus is good, and it's because of his wonderful grace. Now, I get to live the way I want to live because I have his grace, right? Have you ever heard someone talk that way? Have you ever seen someone live that way? It's because of the grace of God, I get to live how I want to live. Well, today we're going to see Paul kind of address that side of the issue. So he goes from the super zealous religious uh, folk, and now he moves over to the people who are like, pleasure, do what you want. It's your life. It's your body. Go for it. And then also, God's grace is so good. So live the way you want to live. And so with that, let's jump into what Paul tells the Philippians um, in reference to these types of people that they're surrounded with. He says this in verse 17. Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. So Paul understood the importance for the Philippians, given the culture, the society, the world they lived in, he understood the importance of locking on to someone who is following God and being faithful to God and being faithful to correct theology and all these things. He's saying, lock on to them and imitate them. And so he starts and he says, imitate me. Not only imitate me, imitate those who are currently imitating me. Okay? And Paul understood the importance um, of this principle. And so here's the first thing that I want to give you today, and it's this. Who you watch will determine how you live. Who you watch will determine how you live. This is so important for us to understand. Paul knew this. This is why he said, hey, look at me. Look at me. Look at those who are currently living faithful lives. And, then, and here's why he teaches them this principle. We'll continue in our passage. He says this, verse 18, for I have often told you and now say again with tears. This is something that he feels so strongly about. He feels so moved about that he says this, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And this is that group of people who say, live your life the way you want to live it. Pleasure is is the height of your pursuit. And so Paul begins to speak against this. He says that there are people who are enemies of the cross. And then he kind of just explains. He, He goes on in greater detail. Let's go to verse 19. He says, their end is destruction. In other words, there's going to be a final and eternal judgment on them. And their end, their fate is eternal hell. Okay, he's just 
he's just calling it like it is. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. In other words, they live their life from pleasure to pleasure. That is their pursuit. It is those desires that drive their life. That is their God. That is what they worship, is their desires and their pleasures. He continues, their glory is in their shame. So, so not only are they participating in the things that they're participating in this culture and in this world, um, and, and the Philippians are surrounded by this. They're seeing this everywhere around them. You've got the hyperzealous religious, and then you've got the people on the other side that say, hey, we don't need to be held under the strictures of the law. Um, we just need to embrace what we want to embrace and do what we want to do. And Paul says, not only do they participate, he says they glory in their shame. In other words, not only are they participating in it, they are delighting in their participation of it. They practice these things. Typically, when you practice something, you try to perfect it, right? You try to get better and better at it. And so Paul says there are some of those that live around you who are not only participating in it, but they're practicing it. They're glorying in it. They are proud of it. They love it. And then look at the, the, the last little clause here. And they are focused on earthly things. And so you could even take this last phrase, and, and it, can, it can give you a good understanding of why they're doing what they're doing in the verses above. Their minds are set on earthly things. I am here. I am now. I'm going to set my mind on the things in front of me here on this earth. And that's how I'm going to live my life, as if there is only earth in front of me. And so Paul is, is trying to warn them. And so he continues to warn the Philippians not to get sucked into their surroundings. And then he touches on the characteristics. He touches on the, the fate that awaits them. And so this just brings me to the question that we have to wrestle with, and it's this. Who are you watching? Who are you watching? This is what Paul was driving at. Because, because who you watch will determine how you live. Who is it that you're watching? Who is it in your life that you are imitating? Who is it in your life, not necessarily in a religious sense, but who in your life is it that you idolize? Who in your life do you listen to? Do you watch? Who are you surrounding yourself with? Paul is saying, this is crucial. You have to get this. This is so important. There's so much on the line. There's people on the religious side of this. There's people on the non-religious side of this. There's people trying to fuse these two things as if you can be religious and also live for every pleasure that you want without restraint. He's saying, this is so important that you get this because the people you surround yourself with, the people that you watch will determine the way that you're going to live your life. And so Paul's pleading with the Philippians. I wrote down this quote. This is, a, this is a common quote. You will become the sum total of the people you surround yourself with. You will become the sum total of the people you surround yourself with. There's another saying, okay? And these are not original to me. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Paul understood this. He got this. That's why he said, imitate me. Imitate those who are faithful to the word of God, that are faithful to the gospel and are living it out the very best that they can. And so, and so then Paul starts there, but then he, he shifts and he goes to make another point that is vital for us. If we're going to live godly lives in, in, a, in an ungodly culture, in an ungodly world, just like the Philippians did, here's the next thing that Paul says. We're going to go to the next verse, verse 20. He says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is making a statement about our fundamental identity as Christians. This is an identity statement. So not only does he say who you watch matters, but also Paul is saying this, when you know who you are, you know how to live. When you know who you are, you know how to live. There's a correlation here. And so Paul is reminding the Philippians that their ultimate identity is this. Children of God, citizens of heaven. Children of God, citizens of heaven. All right, tell your neighbor, 
Children of God, citizens of heaven. Tell them. Children of God, citizens of heaven. This is our identity. If you're in Christ, if you're in Christ, if you are a child of God, if you are a follower of Christ, if you are a child of God, and your identity is, in this case, particularly Paul talks about, you are a citizen of heaven. This is what defines who you are. And so let me ask you, how do you define your identity? What is it that you think your life is defined by? Like really, really wrestle with this question. There are so many people that struggle with the idea of identity. Where, who am I? What, what governs my life and the way that I live? Well, Paul seems to think that the way you live is governed by who you are and who you watch. That, that is the determinant for whether you're going to live a godly life in a godless culture, in an ungodly world. And so I actually came up with um, a, a little phrase here, okay? This can kind of help us refine and understand a little bit about where we truly find our identity, okay? And so this is, this is extremely complicated, as you can see, okay? My name is Joe, and I am fill in the blank. That blank is so important. What you put in that blank will govern the way you live your life. What are you putting in that blank? What are you allowing to defy the essence of who you are? Paul says you're a citizen of heaven. You don't belong on this earth. This is not your permanent residence. You're a follower of Christ. You're a child of God. You're a citizen of heaven. And they were, therefore, you should live as though you are a citizen of heaven. And so I want to ask you, what do you put in that blank? Just replace your name, and what do you put in that blank? For some of us, it might be what we do for our work. For some of us, it might be how many relationships we can get into. For some of us, it might be the grades that we make. I am a scholar. I am an A student. For some of us, we, we, we fill this blank in and usually, whatever you're going to fill into that blank, that's where you're going to find your primary identity. And here's what I would want to tell you, Progression Church, is this. Your name is whatever your name is, and you are a citizen of heaven. Therefore, live as though you are a citizen of heaven. Your primary identity is found not in how you perform, not in how others perceive you, um, not in all these other things. Your primary identity your identity, not even primary, your identity, if you're in Christ, is found in Christ and defined by your citizenship in heaven. Therefore, you will act like a citizen of heaven. Now, one day, Jess, uh, just a while back, this was like a couple of years ago. This is actually a really embarrassing story. I don't know why I do this to myself. But um, so uh, Jess comes home. She had just made a trip to Walmart, and she comes home with this jacket, okay? And um, it's, I mean, she's a girl. She bought a girl jacket, all right? So uh, you'll understand why this is relevant. All right, so she comes home with this jacket, and I'm like, that yeah, looks really good. I like that jacket. You know, it's like a rain jacket, um, but also it's kind of casual. You could wear it even on a non-rainy day or whatever. Like, it was a really, really good-looking jacket. And I'm like, I like that jacket. That looks good on you. And then I was like, I like that jacket. I like that. I kind of want that jacket. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so I'm like, I... Jess, is it crazy that, I mean, it doesn't look super girly. I kind of like that jacket. I need a jacket like this. And then I kind of threw it out there like, what if I went to Walmart? We live right down the way from Walmart. What if I went to Walmart and bought that jacket? She was like, really? And I'm like, maybe. <laughs> and so then I come up with this plan. I'm like, you know what? It's Walmart. It's going to be at an affordable price. I'm going to go. I'm going to find the biggest lady jacket I can find. And I'm going to wear this jacket. I don't think it's, I think I'll be able to pull this off. I don't think it'll be obvious. So the loser I am, I get in the car, I go to Walmart to buy this jacket. I wander into the women's section and I'm just kind of like <laughs> thumbing through <laughs> as fast as I can. Like, you know how when kids you would hide in the clothes rack, you know, kind of like hop out of the clothes rack, thumb through a little bit, find, try to find the size. Got my size. And got out of Dodge as fast as I could, right? I don't think any, I don't think any Walmarters were on to me, okay? 
So I get home, and this is actually, this is the moment of truth, guys. When you get home, you know, I probably should have tried it on in the store. <laughs> okay? I was, I was about to say, well, I mean, everybody does this. When they get home, they try their clothes on that they bought. But uh, most of you actually just tried on there. But anyways, so as I show up, I put on the jacket. It's the moment of truth. I put it on, and I'm like, all right, okay. I'm like very hopeful. I want this to work. And then I literally, you know, fashion show for Jess. I step into Jess. It's in our bedroom. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I'm like, what do you think? <laughs> and Jess, I'm telling you, Jess, she was trying to be as optimistic as she could. I, I saw it in her eyes. She wanted this for me, okay? <laughs> she wanted this for me. But the only word she could muster is, it looks like you're wearing a girl's jacket, right? <laughs> and, and like the, the, the apparently girls, I wasn't thinking about this, you have more narrow shoulders, okay? And so like the seam is like all the way up here on me, and I'm just like, dang it, this doesn't work, okay? Here's what I want to tell you, and here's why this is kind of relevant for some of you. I was trying to make something fit that didn't fit. It didn't work for me, and I tried to force it to the extent that I went and bought a lady's jacket, okay? I tried to make it work. But here's what I want to let you know as a follower of Christ. You are a citizen of heaven. You are a child of God. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And some of us are not living like we are. And I want to let you know this because I think some of us know this deep down inside. You're like, man, I'm trying to live this way, but this just doesn't fit. I know this isn't a fit for me. I know that I'm a child of God. I know, that, I, I know that I should be pursuing greater things than what I'm pursuing in my life right now. And I just want you to know, like, your suspicions, and we would call this conviction from the Holy Spirit, is accurate. It's not a good fit for you. It doesn't fit. You're a citizen of heaven. You are called to greater things. And so I want to encourage you and call you out of whatever that pattern of sin is that you're walking in and that you feel enslaved by. You are free. You are a free citizen. And that's not who you are, and it doesn't fit, and you know it. The Holy Spirit is convicting you of it, and I'm telling you, come on, walk out of it. Take the jacket off. It's uncomfortable. And so some of us just needed to hear that today, that, that some of us, even though we're citizens of heaven, we try to fit into a different lifestyle that doesn't work for us. But if I'm being real with you, um, also in this walk, being transparent, we always want to be transparent as pastors with you. If I'm being real, sometimes it's hard for me, and it's discouraging for me. Like, I have to call Brian, or I have to confess to Ryan, or I have to confess to my small group guys that, man, like, I have sin in my life. And I'm trying to do my best to live a godly life in an ungodly world, but it's hard, and it's discouraging, and I know that I'm a pastor, and I should probably be, probably be beyond this because I'm a pastor, but I'm not, because I'm a human, and it's difficult. And I look around me, and I see other people participating in things and living lives the way they want to live their lives, and I think, man, am I, God, am I going to be able to pull this off? Paul would say... Imitate me, imitate those who are following God, and not only that, know who you are. Because when you know who you are, you know how to live. And so if that's you, if you're just like, hey man, real talk, I struggle. This is difficult. This is not easy for me. Look at the last verse that Paul shares, and I hope that this is going to be what pushes you across the finish line. He says this in verse 21. He, Paul, is talking about Jesus he says, he will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body. What a promise. This is Paul saying, look, you, you have this broken body right now. You have this fleshly nature that tries to entice you and pull you back into sin. And sometimes you succumb. But just know this. That's not who you are. You're a citizen of heaven. And while you wage this war here on earth, know this. It's not always going to be this way. And your struggle and your agony and your shame and, and, and the times that you find yourself white-knuckling trying to live a godly lifestyle, he says, hey, don't worry. The resurrection's coming. You're going to share in my resurrected body, and you won't have to deal with this stuff anymore. 
And then he backs it up by the power that enables it. He says the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. He's saying he holds all the power and authority. He will transform you. This will not be a struggle forever. So keep going. Keep fighting. Look around. Surround yourself with people who you can imitate. And not only that, know who you are. You are a citizen of heaven. Live like it. Because when you know who you are, you know how to live. Okay, so we made a really big uh, jump as parents. We made a big move, okay? We bought our first child an iPhone. It happened. Yeah, right? It happened, okay? Look at the insane look on this child's face. In this moment, it's like, what have we done? What have we done, right? No, but in all seriousness, um, for, for us, the kids are constantly like, hey, I want a phone, I want a phone. This is something you will deal with as a parent. Um, but uh, constantly, Manny was just like, man, I want a phone. My friends have a phone and everything. And, and our line has always been, listen, it's not an age that we're waiting on. It's whether or not we think you're ready. We're not waiting on an age. It's whether or not you're ready. And so we had lots of conversations. Am I ready yet? No, you're not ready. A few months later, I'm ready now, right? No, you're not ready, okay? And then finally, it comes a time where we're like, you know what? I think you're ready. And so what we did was that we told Manny, we actually knew um, that she was going to get the phone, right? But we told her, hey, we're going to go on a, on a trial period, and we, wanna, we think you might be getting close to getting a phone. We think you might be getting to that place where you're responsible enough, and she is. And so we're going to take just a couple of months, and we want you to just continue to demonstrate to us that you are ready for this, right? And so it's really, really funny. It's like any chore we would ask her to do, we didn't even finish the sentence. She was on top of it. She was just like, you mean, you mean I have a shot? That I'm in the window? Okay? And she's like, it's like, Manny, will you do the dishes? Oh, okay. You're closing the dishwasher machine. Okay? All right. Well done. Okay. You know, she's just like, hey, you just let me know. Anything needs to be done around here, I'm on it, right? There was a preferred future for Vanny, right? She knew she had a shot at an iPhone. She had this preferred future that propelled her forward. It kept her faithful. I want to let you know, as citizens of heaven, you have a preferred future, a resurrection body that's coming for you. Jesus is going to make all things new, and you are going to be a part of the all things, and he's going to make your body new, and you're not going to struggle with sin temptation, and you're not going to feel shame, and you're not going to feel like you have to white-knuckle it sometimes. You're not going to be discouraged and call your friends and have to confess to them what you did last night. Um, you're not going to have to live with this because Jesus will resurrect you, and he is good on his promise because he has the eternal power to do it. And so what I want to encourage you to do in those moments that you feel discouraged is look to your preferred future. In, in, in Christianity, we call the word hope. But we don't mean hope like, oh, I hope we get eternal salvation or, oh, I hope I will one day be resurrected. It is a preferred future, an eager expectation that we say, my hope is, what, is in what is to come for me, and I can't wait. And that's how Paul finishes things out. So I want to leave you with this. Your preferred future will fuel your faithfulness. Your preferred future will fuel your faithfulness. Keep going. Don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged. Okay, so how can we apply this to our lives? How can we live this out, okay? Here's a few things that I want to tell you, and this is a very basic passage, and so the instruction's pretty clear, okay? Here's the first thing. Find faithful people to imitate. You need faithful people in your life who you can imitate. Some of you, just even this short time that we've had together, you're like, you know what? I I'm surrounding myself with people that are having a bad influence on me. And you're wondering, man, is it really worth it for, for me to, to give this up and try and pursue relationships that are going to move me closer to God? Yes, it's worth it. But I'm not just talking to you college students. I'm talking to you adults. Find faithful people that you can look to and that you can imitate. Here's the next thing. Become someone others can imitate. For some of you, you've been walking faithfully with the Lord. You're growing in your faith. You're maturing in your faith. And it's time for you to, to step up and be that someone that others can imitate. But let me tell you, they cannot imitate you if they don't have access to you. 
They can't imitate what they can't access. And so for you, your move might be to write on the purple card, like, hey, I want to mentor somebody. I want to disciple someone. I want to, or I want to work towards this. If you're in the, I need someone to imitate camp, your move is going to be to plug into a small group. You need to find a group of people that you can surround yourself with who are going to encourage you in your faith. And not only that, you might be like, hey, I want to be discipled by somebody. I need this in my life. And so if that's you, just use that purple card. We try and use it all the time. We just want to know where you are. And while we might not be able to make the connection immediately, it's on our radar, and we know we can take steps toward finding someone who can invest in you, finding somebody that, can, that you can imitate, and also some of you that we can help you to be that person that others can imitate. But notice I put become. Become someone, because none of us have arrived, none of us are perfect, you don't have to be perfect to be somebody to be imitated. You just have to be in pursuit. Does that make sense? Here's the third thing. Remember who you are. This is vital for you. As you go back to your classes, as you go back to your office, as you go back to your stores, as you go whatever your job is, wherever you find yourself doing, the primary identifier for you is who you are in Christ. That's your primary identifier. You are a citizen of of heaven. And so, the, I mean, these are very basic, very basic steps for us to take. And some of us, like, I trust you and I trust the Holy Spirit. Like, He knows, He's leading you and to know what your step is and what that looks like. And so, maybe take that step. But then there's a last step, and that's to be saved. And we always try and share this one. You see, it's not enough just to try to act like Jesus. And what I mean by that is you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. You can't, once again, like I say, you can't truly imitate someone you don't have access to. And so for some of us here, maybe you don't consider yourself a Christian. Maybe you've never made that decision to follow Christ. Maybe you've never confessed your sins in a real way and said, God, I, I confess my sins to you and it's because of my sin. I need, I need forgiveness and I'm, I'm trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. Maybe you've never made that decision before. And if that's you, I'm going to just invite everybody here with your head bowed, your eyes closed. I'm just going to invite you just to, to be still with, just be still where you are and this will kind of help to not be distracted. If you're a believer and those first three things kind of resonated with you, I would encourage you just to spend time just praying to God. Spend time being real with yourself, being open to what the Holy Spirit might be prompting in you. What he might be pushing you to do, compelling you to do. Maybe it's something you need to give up. I want to encourage you right where you are right now, just do, do that. Pray. Talk with the Holy Spirit. And then others of you where you would say, you know what, Joe, you had mentioned being saved. I don't know that I've ever been saved. Um, I've known about God. Like, I've, I'm familiar with the name Jesus, but if I'm honest, I don't know that I've ever submitted my life to him, to the lordship of Jesus. If that's you, I'm just going to lead you through a very simple prayer. And we always say this prayer is not magical. This prayer is not mystical. This, this is just an expression of the posture of your heart to God. And so just right where you are, just pray something like this. If this is a step you need to take for the first time, if you've never done this, just pray something like this. God, I confess to you the sin in my life. I acknowledge that I deserve hell because of my sin. I, I acknowledge to you that I deserve destruction because of the way that I'm living my life. I'm, I'm doing it on my own terms. But for the first time, God, I want to trust in the finished work of Jesus. I believe he's the perfect sacrifice to save me from my sins. And, and right here, right now, I want to make the decision to submit my life to him to follow him, to follow his leadership. 
I put the full weight of my soul on the finished work of Jesus. I want to be saved. And with everybody's head bowed, everybody's eyes closed, we always do this. We're not going to call you out. We're not going to call you to the front. We're not going to make you stand up. We're not going to do any of that. But if you prayed that prayer, if you made that decision to follow Jesus for the first time ever, just raise your hand. Raise it nice and high so we can see it. I just want to know what God's doing in the hearts of our people. Hey, awesome. Well, guys, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to continue in worship. Lord Jesus, I thank you for Progression Church. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the gift that you've given me to be able to preach to Progression Church and just to share um, what you're teaching me. Um, I don't deserve to be up here, but it's I'm not standing up here in my own merit, but I'm standing up here because of the merit of Jesus and how good he is. Lord, help our people to, to understand that who, who they are looking at defines how they live. And, and God, their identity, where they look for their identity defines how they live. I pray that you would help our people to understand that they are citizens of heaven. That you called them to live that way. And that there is a preferred future for us in those moments of discouragement. And Lord, for those who are disheartened, for those who feel tired, for those who are dealing with shame, for those that have secret sin, Lord, in this moment, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just assure them that you are present and you are empowering them to live a life of obedience. They don't have to live a life of defeat. God, if there are people who are struggling with whether or not they're going to follow you, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to convict them and help them to see their need for a Savior. And that, Lord, you would give them the courage to step out and say, yes, yes, I'll follow you. I'll give my life to you. Your way is the greatest way to live. And so, Lord, I pray for the salvation of those in the room who just aren't there yet, but, but may be in process. Father, I pray that we worship you with everything that we have in the next few minutes. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Praise God. Praise God. Hey, y'all can be seated. Man, I got some announcements for you. Uh, but you know how preachers be, so I got to share like, like 30 seconds of something else, right? Um, one thing is this, man. I'm just thankful for our church family, you know? Uh, I don't know if you go through like weeks or whatever. It's uh, kind of like outside. Like it's, you know, kind of a stormy, weird week, you know? I know for a lot of us, you know, for different reasons, we've gone through a lot of things. One of the things I love about church is whenever we get together and we worship Jesus, it just brings joy to my heart, right? That's a good thing. I love that. And also, not only is it great for me, it's great that we get to do ministry together, right? That we get to serve together. And this year, we've been kind of kind of charting this, just how the church family's doing in mission, right? And these normal color ping pong balls represent guests that you guys have brought and the orange ones represent people who have told us in some way shape or form that they prayed and asked God to save them and just from the last couple weeks I'm going to dump in four of the normal ping pong balls and two of the orange ping pong balls and this is one thing I love about this is that these aren't any people that I invited or personally shared the gospel with you know what happened we as a church family reached out to our city does that make sense and we do this together, and I love that. So I just want to tell you, I'm thankful to be a part of this church. I'm part of, thankful to be a part of our family. Our community group ministers to us as much as it as we minister to them. Man, it's the good stuff. Um, and this is not anything that counts for anything. I just threw my cup in there, all right? Um, hey, I want to let you know some announcements. First one is this. Uh, hey, if you've never filled out that purple card in your chair, man, we would love to just uh, know who you are. So please do that and leave that in your chair. If you're in town guests, out of town guests, you've been here before, just never fill one out. I mean, we would love for you to do it so we can know who you are. Um, our pastors meet together on Wednesday and we pray for all the cards and all this kind of stuff. We'd love to pray for you. So let us know who you are. If you leave us your email address, we'll even try to send you a, a, like an email gift card. Just thanking you for joining us this week. Um, kind of as an encouragement to you. So if you if you've never done that, just do that. Don't even listen to the rest of the announcements. That's the most important one for you. Okay. Um, second one is this. Another thing we talk about every week is giving. It's a way to worship Jesus. And hey, I want to encourage you in this. 
Um, so, so last week we had Small Business Sunday and Blood Drive. Y'all did awesome, right? Um, I know at least eight of y'all gave blood. A bunch of y'all tried, but we couldn't for different reasons. Y'all had to probably more than that go to the bus and try, which was awesome. Um, and then also Small Business Sunday, y'all supported people in the church family, including my kids who were selling cards, all right, sports cards. And, uh, and uh, they did way better than they thought. And they were like, I didn't know that the church uh, liked cards so much. I was like, buddy. They like you. Like, they, they are kind. You know what I'm saying? They are a nice church family. I don't know if they're just, like, card, you know, favorites, you know, kind of deal. But anyway, we're talking about that, and then we've kind of been having a conversation about, you know, uh, now that you're earning money, what do you do with it? And we talked about the importance of, like, saving some and investing in different things and also giving, right? And one of the things that we do is, as believers is with what God entrusts to us, we pray about and we try to discern what we should give back to the mission of God by through through our local church. So we're talking about that with our kids. It's kind of fun. So thank y'all for buying cards because now we're going to have spiritual conversations with our kids. Pretty cool. Um, but uh, so different ways you can give uh, practically. All right. So we have online progressionbr.com slash give. We have like a little thing you can give on the way out. Um, the drop box. And we also have text giving and 318 is your text giving. But all these different ways hopefully are ways for us to worship God by giving back of what he's invested in us we give back to him to further his mission, right? Um, and that's something that's awesome. So uh, if this is your church, we encourage you to take that step. If you haven't, if it's not your church, man, we're just happy you're here today, okay? All right, here's another thing that's coming up. I got a few things. Actually, I want to give you some actual announcements, and I wrote them down because that's important. Um, I got two different things that I want to share with you today from our missions team, all right? Our missions team doing a great job of starting getting us going towards different ways that we can be missional in the city and out of the city. Um, and one thing that we're going to do um, that's going to be very fun that we saw a lot of you guys sign up for last week is Operation Christmas Child. Everybody grab uh, one of these papers that are near you, all right? It may not be in your seat, but it's close by. I want you to grab one of these. It has a QR code. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with what Operation Christmas Child is, this is a suggestion for our mission team. We love it. Everybody's getting behind it. We want to show you just a really short video. It's a one-minute video kind of giving you a picture of what you're actually investing in. Let's see if we can roll that. When children open their boxes, you can hear the laughter, the cheer. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive, and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Because we bring gifts to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you. Thank you. Pretty fun. So this is what we're going to do. If you want to get involved in that and you want to like actually pack a shoebox so that we can send it off to kids and all over the world, um, and including in that is like a gospel presentation and people on the site are actually going to share the gospel with them. It's a very cool thing to love on people in different ways, like that we can care for them in immediate needs and just fun ways, but also by pointing them to the gospel of Jesus. Here's some ways you can do it. Two different ways you can get involved. One is you can actually pack a shoebox. So if you use the QR code that's on this uh, card, it's going to send you to their website and it kind of explains how to do it. You know, y'all had some good questions about some logistics. It answers pretty much everything. If, if it doesn't answer all your questions, you you can talk to me or Joe or, or Owen or anybody. We'll, we'll kind of help you with that. Um, but it's going to give you kind of a pretty clear instructions of how to do that. Um, and here's what I want you to do. If you're going to pack a shoebox, two things I want you to do. One, write it on your card. Over 20 of y'all signed up last week. That's great. Um, just so we know how many people are coming. And then also pack it and bring it back by next Sunday, okay? The national, like, uh, week to kind of take in all the boxes is starting next Monday. Not this Monday, but next Monday. So bring them to church with you next Sunday morning or get with us before so that we can ship it for you, okay? Another way you can get involved is you're like, man, I don't know if I'm going to have time to do that or I don't know if that's my thing, but I'd like to support in a different way is that each box, it costs $10 to ship it because it's going, like, way, way away, all right? So if you're just like, man, I don't know if I can do a shoe box, but I'd love to support somebody and help this in their box. So this is the way you can do that. If you go to the text to give 318 giving, um, 
just there's a little tab that says mission. So the next two weeks, any dollars that you give towards that under the missions tab is going to go to help send off our shoe boxes. Or on Zelle Giving, if you do a memo and you say missions or Operation Christmas Child, we'll know what that giving's for, okay? So if you're like, man, I don't know if I have time to pack a box, but I can help send two, then you can just say, hey, I'll send $20, help two other people send it on their way. Sound good? It's a great way to get involved either way, but it's an awesome thing that we're going to get involved in. Another thing that we're going to do in missions, our missions team has is bags of hope and that's something we get to do in the city where we get to bag up food to give out to people that are in need in our city right now and that is happening on november 16th i believe right um not this saturday but next saturday correct um so here's what i want you to know uh sign up on your card if you would like to do that this is what we're going to do we have eight to ten spots the first eight to ten people that we have sign up and confirm shelby uh, is one of our team leads there she's going to contact you that's going to be kind of our spots for this time and if you don't get to do it this time guess what we've got spots in february and march lined up so this is going to be something we consistently do as a church to do something locally to serve people uh, in need okay another thing that's happening this week which sounds kind of fun is a college girl fellowship Christmas cookie party, all right? Uh, and look, Hannah Crane in college would be at this thing. You know what I'm saying? She might pop over there this week. I don't know. Um, but this looks really, really fun. So, you know, college girls, if you're interested in going, this is what I want you to do. Um, we have the text numbers. If you can't see them, write it on your card with your phone number, and we'll make sure we get it to Riley and Emma so they can contact you, okay? But if you can see it, you can just text them at RSVP. But they're going to hang out, make some Christmas cookies. That sounds like a good time. You know what I'm saying? So let us know if you're coming, either by texting Riley or Emma or writing it on your card with your number so we can contact you. Sounds good? want to make sure that we have enough supplies for that. Um, and two more things. One thing is this. Next week, we have Next Steps Lunch, which is kind of a lunch for newcomers coming to the church. Um, let you know who we are and what we're about and how you can get involved. We're going to eat some canes together. So if you're interested in that, that's happening next Sunday after the service. And the last thing is this. Um, if you recently have prayed and asked God to save you or you have questions about that or you're interested in baptism, I want you to come talk to me after the service. I'll be right there. We have a box, a new believer box that we'll give you that has all kinds of supplies. There's a Bible, a devotion, a pen, all kinds of stuff. There's even a coffee mug in there because for some reason maybe you need that, all right? Um, but we would love to help you and talk to you. I'll be right there and just come and see me. Sound good? All right, that's all 400 of our announcements, but it's a good thing because God's moving the church, right? So we love you. You're dismissed.